Hi everybody, my name is Logan Huskins. I am a software developer here of Oklahoma City. Uh, I worked remote for a company called Live Auctioneers. I write a lot of Go and React stuff there. Um, writing React is sort of what led me down this path of learning about hooks and hopefully I can explain all of that to you all today and maybe you guys can walk away knowing a little more about hooks as well. Slides are acting weird, okay. So what are React hooks? React hooks provide a new way to write components. I know how I felt when I first heard that. It Honestly, it stressed me out a little bit. If you're anything like me, you kind of went on the wheel of JavaScript, learning new framework after new framework, and now you may have settled down like Re on React, like I sort of did. Well, being told there's a new way to write components, components are pretty much the brunt of what React is, and learning a new way to write components feels like you're relearning, to, relearning how to write React, and that's kind of, that's kind of rough. Hopefully by the end of this talk you'll see though that it's not too different from what you're used to and the things that are different aren't hopefully too hard to pick up. What do React hooks allow us to do? They allow us to write stateful components without classes. What does that mean? I mean, we, we kind of had this controversy around classes when they were first, first becoming popular in JavaScript. Some people like them, some people don't. Not having classes is kind of a big change. Um, but I'll show you that, these, that using function components for everything you write with hooks isn't too different. Not having these classes means you have no more this.set state and no more lifecycle methods. Particularly lifecycle methods I feel like are kind of a hindrance on how React was in the past and getting rid of those I think will make our code a lot cleaner and a lot more shareable and a lot more composable. So why do React hooks exist? React, hook ma React hooks exist because they make our code easier to share around our application and with others. We no longer have unrelated logic and lifecycle methods. And if you've used React and you've seen lifecycle methods, I'm sure you've seen component did mount or component will mount that does 15 different unrelated things and then a component will unmount that does a bunch of unrelated things. But those things are related to each other but not really near each other. React hooks kind of helps us get out of that pattern. They also provide an abstraction that helps us simplify testing. When we pull this code out, we'll be able to test it by itself a little more easily. So let's go ahead and look at some code. The first thing I'm gonna do is show you the application that we're gonna be working with. It's a little chat application, and in this application you're able to talk to two people, Kanye West and Megacorp Customer Service. So there's a little Kanye West quote generator running in the background. Megacorp Customer Service is a randomly generated quote thing as well. And we're able to talk back to them and they'll respond. So. Kanye West is typing, he'll say something to us. Good info. <laughs> this is, it is not working. We're gonna fix this on the fly. I'm really sorry about this. It literally worked 20 seconds ago and worked every time we tried this. So doing this on the fly, we're gonna swing back to what this component is and I'm gonna show you how we were going to rewrite it. So we have our class component for message input. I wrote it a little terse, a little, a little more verbose, I guess, than I would have normally written it, but it's to illustrate a purpose. We have our constructor, we bind some function, we bind some methods, we create our state with an empty message. On change of that message, we go ahead and we set our state. With that, we take in what we're typing, we assign it to that message in the state. When we handle our updates, that's basically when we're submitting our message. We check and make sure that the message isn't empty, and if it is empty, we return because we don't want to send that message off. We call our property send message, and that property um, is basically pulled in from the parent component and it's what sends our message off. Then we reset our state to empty, and here's where we're rendering it. Like I said, unfortunately, it's not working as it was just a moment ago, but we're rewriting it anyway, so we're just gonna work on the fly here, it's okay. So we're gonna go ahead and get rid of default here and change the name of message input so we don't have any weird conflicts with naming to message input old. So with React hooks, we're no longer gonna be writing these class components, we can just write function components instead. So we can export default function online, and because we have a function component, we can now destructure our props in the actual, the actual method, or the actual function up here, which I think is a little bit nicer. It allows people who are coming into our component later to see immediately what's available, instead of having to dig through code and seeing this prop is used here, this prop's used here. They can see it all right at the top. 
So we're going to go ahead and take that, um, that send message we had from before and destructure it. So our render method is going to be pretty much the same. Except instead of being a method, we're just going to return it from our function. So let's copy that over. And let's take a look at the things that are going to change. We no longer are going to have to call this.handleUpdate because we can just have a function called handleUpdate. And if you ever watch people type, it's kind of hard to watch because they go a lot slower than you think you would go. It's even worse doing the typing. So please bear with me while I do all of this. We have this.state.message, but we're no longer going to have this.state because we have a function component. That's going to be replaced by our, by our first hook, so let's go ahead and get rid of this.state. And this.handle change, we no longer have the method handle change, so let's go ahead and have the function handle change. Both of these are going to take in an event. And since we are not importing that hook yet, let's go ahead and set message equal to an empty string. And let's test it. All right, our, everything's rendering just fine and nothing's crashing. So let's go ahead and import our first, first hook and see what this is going to look like. The first hook we're going to use is called useState. And we can import it directly from React. useState is going to basically be, it's not a one-to-one -one replacement for set state and this dot state, but it's going to functionally serve the same purpose for us. So use state is just a function. We pass use state the initial value of what we want the state of the thing we're tracking to be. And in this case, we're just tracking a message and we want it to be an empty string. So we're going to go ahead and pass it an empty string. Use state returns something kind of odd. It returns a tuple. And basically what that's going to be is two variables inside of an array, and we're going to destructure that. The first variable they return is the variable of the state we're tracking between our renders. So that's going to be our message. The second variable it's going to return is the function we use to update that message. So the general pattern you're going to do here is you're going to have the name of the variable for the first one and then set the name of the variable for the second one. So let's go ahead and see that everything looks like, except for our updates and everything, that everything is at least rendering. We're looking good. So let's go ahead and re-implement our handle update and our handle change. So when we change the value in that form, before we were doing this.setState and then we had an object with a message in it that we were passing it that took that event value, we're no longer going to be doing that. We are just calling setMessage and passing it the same data. And now we can get rid of that this dot set, set state. So let's go ahead and test it. And this is going to be the thing that breaks. It's not breaking because hooks don't work. It is breaking because I did something wrong. And I really apologize about that. Anybody want to help me debug on the fly? Handle updates. On submit is handle update. On change is handle ch change. So let's call it, let's call this handle change. And that handle update. Great, we're working now. Yay, live coding. <laughs> All right, so how do, we go, how do we submit this? This is going to be a little bit different than it was before in a couple places instead of just the one place. So let's go ahead and copy our code over. So we no longer have, we're, we still want to check if the message is empty because we don't want to submit that if it's empty. We no longer have the this.state before our message, so we can just get rid of that. We no longer have our this.props before send message because we destructured it up at the top. We can get rid of that. We can get rid of this.setState. And if you're noticing a pattern here, React just got a lot more ergonomic. It's a lot easier to type, which I like. So we don't have this set state anymore. We have set message. So we're going to reset our message after we've submitted it. Sorry, just empty string. And we can get rid of that. So it's quite a bit shorter. If you write a lot of React, losing all of these keystrokes is really nice. This dot set state, not having to do structure everything every time you use it in every method. All of these things make React, I think, a little bit easier to use and a little bit easier to read. <laughs> oh, 
Only free thinkers. Sure, Kanye. Thanks. All right, so let's go ahead and look at a couple more slides about this. So there's, I have a couple notes about use state. You can pass use state any type as an argument. We pass it an empty string, but it could be a number, it could be an array, it could be an object, it could be nothing, which would default to null. But you need to be careful with use state. You can't use it exactly like you used set state and this dot state from the class components. Use state with an object always replaces and never merges. So when you call this dot set state in a typical class component, if you're not updating the entirety of the state, say you have seven or eight things you're keeping track of and you're only updating one, this dot set state will merge your old state with your new state, only replacing the thing that it actually needs replaced. Use state doesn't do that. Use state replaces the entire object if you're using an object. So because of that, it's typically recommended that if you're tracking a bunch of things with your use state, you call multiple use states. So we called a use state for message. If we were also tracking a color, we would call a, a use state for color. If we were tracking a bunch of different things, we would call a bunch of different use states. And like I mentioned before, use state with no args defaults to null. So there are a couple of rules around hooks as well. And now I think is a good time to introduce them. You can only call hooks at the top level of a function. And this kind of goes back to using the multiple use states and how that's gonna work with React. You can't call hooks inside of loops. You can't call hooks inside of conditionals. And the reason for that is React needs these hooks to be in the same order every time. If you're using a bunch of use states, the only way React knows which thing to return from which use state is the order that they're called. So throwing them in loops is gonna mess that up for us. You can only call hooks in React functions or custom hooks, which I will show later, which is kind of how we're gonna compose these hooks. There's an ESLint plugin called ESLint plugin React hooks. This isn't a rule, but this enforces the rules. If you're using ESLint and you're using React hooks, please use this. It will catch a lot of bugs for you before they happen. So let's look at some more hooks. So we're going to look at another part of our little chat application, and it's over here. Like I mentioned before, we can chat with two people, Megacorp Customer Service and Kanye West. Up at the top in the document title, and I hope that's pretty easy to read in the back, it says we're chatting with Kanye West, and now it says we're chatting with Megacorp Customer Service. We also have a timer for how long we've been chatting with these people. We're gonna rewrite these. So we have this class component that we're going to take and make a function component using hooks. Let's go ahead and look at the first thing we're gonna change, which is that, w first thing we're gonna implement, which is that document title update. Like I mentioned before, you have these, um, you have these lifecycle methods, and if you've used a React, you've probably seen them before, but all this is saying is when the component mounts, do this stuff. When the component updates, do this stuff. When the component's about to unmount, do this stuff. So for us, when the component mounts, we wanna take the current prop of who we're chatting with and assign it to the document title. When the component updates, we, want, we have access to the previous props in the previous state. So what we're gonna do with that is we're gonna see that the previous props version of who we're chatting with and the new props version of who we're chatting with, if they don't equal one another, we need to update who we're chatting with. We do this so that we don't continuously update that document title every time the component re-renders. Updating a document title is pretty cheap, but if you get into big things that take a lot of time, that's really gonna slow down your application and cause a lot of problems. So it's a good, a good idea to always check those things. So let's rewrite this. We're gonna get rid of default like we did before and rename it online old so we don't have those conflicts. Export default function online. We're gonna go ahead and destructure our properties again. We have chatting with, change chat with, and users online. And let's copy over our render code. All right, so because we're using a function component, we no longer have these lifecycle methods. So what can we use to replace them? And this is where our next hook comes in. We're gonna imp import a hook called use effect that's gonna allow us to re replace some of the logic we're using with this lifecycle methods. Now, I wanna be, I wanna say this early, use effect is not a one-to-one -one replacement for lifecycle methods. You really need to kind of shift how you think you can't think in terms of these lifecycle methods, and I'll show you how use effect is, how, what use effect does and why you can't do that as we implement this. Use effect is pretty simple, it's just a function. The function takes two arguments, and we're gonna talk about the first one first, and that is a callback. 
So what use effect is going to do, it is going to, to allow us to produce side effects from our function components, because that's all the lifecycle methods were doing. There were side effects outside of what was actually rendering. They were like, we're gonna render, and then we're going to do a bunch of other stuff, and those things are the side effects. So it's going to allow us to take these side effects, and then as I'll show you in a minute, synchronize those side effects with changes in our state. So what side effect do we wanna to produce to update that document title? We wanna update the document title. So let's go ahead and copy that code over. We have document title equals chat, this.profs.chatting with. We don't need that anymore. We can just do chatting with. So use effect is a little, little different than lifecycle methods, like I mentioned. When does use effect actually launch off? So this is gonna be one of the, one of the at least for me, one of the harder things I had to wrap my head around with use effect. What use effect does is it launches two different distinct times. The second time is actually a bunch of times, but the first time is after the first render. So after you render your component for the first time, use effect launches. The reason it waits until after the render is because these side effects shouldn't prevent your component from rendering. Your application would be really slow for that. You need to have a state in your render that handles when these side effects have a launch. The second time it launches is after every subsequent re-render. And the reason I count that all as a second time is because we can do a little bit of tweaking on it here in a moment. But as it currently stands, this use effect is gonna launch after the first render and then after every subsequent re-render. Let's take a look. Fail to compile, time is not defined. We are going to, because we don't have our time implemented yet. So it says we're chatting with Kanye West, and now it says we're chatting with Megacorp customer service. But like I mentioned before, we don't wanna change, we don't wanna update that every time we update our component, or every time our component re-renders. It's inefficient. So how do we go about preventing those re-renders after, or those updates after every subsequent re-render? Well, that's where the second argument of use effect comes in. And this argument, I think, is probably the hardest part about React hooks in general, at least it was for me. It's called the dependency array. And what the dependency array is, is it is an array of variables you want to synchronize the state you're launching off with this use effect with. That doesn't mean much, but I hope, hopefully it will once you see it in action. So there's a couple different things we can do with this dependency array. We can omit it like we did, and when we omit it, we launch off this use effect like we mentioned, after the first render and then after every subsequent re-render. We can pass an empty array for this use effect or we can pass an array with values. When we pass an array with values, what we're telling React is we only want to launch the side effect after the first render and then after every subsequent re-render when one of these values in this array actually changes. So what value do we care about? We care about who we're chatting with. So what we're telling React right now is render the component, launch the side effect that use effect spawns. Re-render the comp component, did chatting with change? If so, go ahead and relaunch that side effect. So let's take a look at it. It should look the same. But it is changing who we're, who we're, it is changing who we're chatting with in that document title. So I mentioned that you can also pass it an empty array. What you're telling React when you pass it in the NPRA is that you don't care about changes in your state. You don't need to synchronize the side effect with anything. So, that being said, React is going to run the use effect after the first render, and then not again, never again. So we're chatting with Kanye West, and it says we're still chatting with him, which is incorrect. So let's go ahead and throw that chatting with back, and we should be back to where we were. Great. So now, we need to implement our timer. For a timer, we need to keep track of state. We need to keep track of what the current time that we've been chatting with that person actually is so it can track how long we've been chatting with them. So we're gonna go ahead and import use state. We need to track that state for the time, so we're gonna go const and then our destructured array, which is that tuple that's being passed back, time, set time, not set time out. It aggressively predicts stuff sometimes. Use state, its default value is going to be zero. So this timer is a side effect of our component, or incrementing the timer rather is a side effect of our component. So we're gonna need another use effect to do, to do this. So let's go ahead and make the use effect with our callback. We're not gonna pass it a dependency array for now. We're gonna start with a really naive implementation of this because I wanna show what happens when it doesn't work. Because when you know why things aren't working, it's, I think it's a little easier to figure out 
what's happening and why they can work. So let's look at how we implemented it before. We had our time tracked in state. We had our timer and our component did mount. And we assigned it to this dot timer. We we're creating an interval. And every second, or every thousand milliseconds, we're updating our state to increment the time by one. When we change who we're chatting with in a component did update, so when the component did update and we check the, the previous props change from the current props, we go ahead and reset our timer to zero. And when component will unmount, we clear our, we run a clear interval which clears our timer. And this is why we had to assign it to this. We assigned it with this dot timer instead of just being a timer because we needed to access it in multiple methods. We are clearing this interval because we want our component, when our component goes away, we don't want to continue running this timer in the background. That's gonna cause a memory leak. We wanna clean it up. So let's re-implement this with hooks. The first thing we need to do is implement basically the set interval. Because hooks are gonna let us encapsulate all the logic around this side effect in one place, we don't have to assign it to this. It doesn't need to be accessible outside of this. We can just assign it to a constant. So const timer equals set interval. We're gonna do 1,000 milliseconds again. And what we're doing in our set interval, and I'm gonna introduce a bug right now. If you know about hooks and know how this works, you're gonna probably recognize this pretty quick. I'm going to set our time to time plus one. All right, this is going to immediately break, but I wanna show you what it looks like when it breaks and then explain why it's breaking. So if you look at our timer, it's going zero, one, it's flickering to two, it's flickering to three, it's, it's acting very odd. So I'm gonna comment this out really quick and save it so my browser doesn't crash, because that will be a big memory leak too. So what was happening? It looked like it was incrementing at first, but then after it got to the first second, it went back to zero and then back to one and then to two and then one, two, three, one, two, three, four. What was happening there? Well, what do we know about use effect? We know that use effect, like I mentioned, runs after the initial render and then every subsequent re-render. So what's happening? We're rendering our component, we're creating a timer. That timer, every second, increments our time, which is part of our state. Changing our state is going to create a re-render. So we're re-rendering our component, which means we run our use effect again, which means we create a new timer. So now we have two timers running, and then we'll have more timers running once that increments time, so on and so on, until we have just an exponentially large number of timers running and our browser crashes and your customers are really mad at you. So, how, how, do we, how do we guarantee that we only have one timer running at a time? Well, use effect allows you to return a function. That function allows you to clean up any code from your use effect, but it operates a little bit different than component will unmount. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna write it, and then we're gonna talk about what it does. The function doesn't have to be called cleanup. I'm just calling it cleanup for illustrative purposes, but we're gonna go ahead and set our time back to zero. And then we're gonna clear our interval. Clear interval timer. So cleanup is gonna run in, like all of you use effect until you're kinda used to it, it's gonna feel weird when cleanup's gonna run. So, what happens now is our component initially renders, we run our use effect, our component re-renders, and then before every subsequent re-render, we're going to run our cleanup. And it's going to clean up the use effect from before. So we're rendering, use effect, re-render, we're cleaning up the first use effect, and then we're running another use effect. Re-rendering, cleaning up the second use effect, running the next use effect. So basically it's cleaning up like one run after you would think it is, because it's rendering, then it's cleaning up from before it. This is going to guarantee we have one timer running at a time. It's also not going to work, but we're gonna talk about why. So we have a timer going from, it's just, it's just zero, zero, and then you see a little flicker of one. What's happening here is every time we clean up, we're setting our time back to zero. We're also cleaning up every time we increment the time. So we're, increment, we're rendering, creating our timer, incrementing the time, re-rendering, cleaning up, which is setting our time back to zero and destroying our timer every single time. So we're never gonna get above one and we're not gonna see one very frequently. So how do we guarantee that this only, this only reruns when we need it to? So this cleanup is only going to rerun prior to another use effect or when the component goes away. So you're basically going to be rendering, running your use effect, then if you need to rerun your use effect, it will clean up the one before and rerun your use effect. Well, how do we determine if we need to rerun our use effect? 
dependency array. We only care about cleaning up and then recreating this time anytime we change who we're chatting with. Now there's a quirk of, a of the dependency arrays though. Do not lie to React about what dependencies you care about. If you have a dependency array with variables in it, you always need to express all of the variables that you're using in your use effect. So what React, what React is doing with these use effects is it's taking this function and then it's taking the dependency array, and, but because it's just being passed a function, it can't, it can't inspect the function and tell what variables you're using or what you need to synchronize your side effects with. It can do that with an array, so that's why we have a dependency array. But, and the ESLint plugin will enforce this, if you have a dependency array with variables in it, it needs to have all of the variables that you're using in your use effect that you need, so you can synchronize with them. Well, we're using time, but we're not going to pass that in the dependency array. Let's see what happens. Our timer goes zero, one, stops. Zero, two, stops. Zero, three, stops. Okay, well what's happening here? What you have with this use effect is essentially, it's just a, it's just a closure. So when you render a component in React, you need to think about your state as constants for that render. So our initial state for time is zero. In that, for our first render, we're essentially saying set time zero plus one because our time is zero and time is just going to be a constant for that render. So we launch off something that's saying every second set the time to zero plus one. Well, when we change, when we're chatting with, our time at that point is one, so we're saying when we re-render, every second set the time to one plus one because it's capturing the state of the things around it because between those renders, you're essentially using constants for those variables in your state. So we could add our time back, to our, or add our time to our dependency array, but then we're just gonna run into the same problems we were running into before. We're going to increment our time, it's going to cause a re-render, we're going to say, oh, the time changed, we need to go ahead and do this use effect stuff. So we're gonna clean up our first timer, create a new timer, increment the time, so on and so on. So, how can we not use this time variable inside of this use effect? Well, set state provides a way to more functionally update it. So you can pass, you can pass set time, a variable or a number or a string or whatever, to set that variable, to set that state, or you can pass it a function. That function is going to have access to the current state of the thing you're updating. So, we will have access to current time, and then what we return from it is what's going to be set. So current time plus one. That way, when we launch this use effect and we have this closure that's containing the state of what we're currently rendering, that's gonna just be treated as a constant, we don't have to keep track of that in our use state. We always know when we call set time, we're going to capture the current time and increment it by one. So we can get rid of time in our dependency array. Let's see what that looks like. An incrementing timer and an incrementing timer. So everything's working. So hopefully just seeing this code, even though until you really dig down, I feel like into use effect and write a couple of your own, it looks a little bit better than these lifecycle methods in the sense that all of your code for your timer is right here in this use effect. You don't have it spread out between multiple methods. It's just all a self-contained thing. This use effect contains all of your code for your document title. So it's going to contain anything that was in the, the mount lifecycle method, anything in the update lifecycle method. You don't need to branch to, to like have those document title updates in multiple places. It's all right here. You also don't have the merging of the logic in those lifecycle methods. So in, like before, in that component, component will mount, you had, you were updating a timer, or you're creating a timer, and you're also setting the document title. That's two unrelated things in one method. That's gonna make it really hard to, to share any of that later. It makes it impossible, because you're gonna have these things that are kind of spaghetti together, but then also spread out between multiple methods. It's basically unshareable at that point. With this use effect, you've got it all self-contained into just this function. Well, how do I share this code between my components? It's just in this function. I can't, I, I can't do anything with this if I have another component that needs to update the document tile for whatever reason. 
That's where custom hooks come in. Hooks are a composable thing. You can have hooks inside of hooks inside of hooks. Now you can also write what are called custom hooks. Custom hooks are basically your own example of what a use state would be, or your own example of a use effect. They're, they're the things that you want to do that you want to be able to import and use as hooks in other React components. Luckily, they're just JavaScript functions. Function, so this is gonna be something that, the, um, that React is going to need. You have to start any of your custom hooks with use something. And that's how React knows it's going to be a hook. So you can do, we're gonna do use document title update. Actually, let's get rid of that. Use document title update. So this is just a function, and you can do lots of things with functions, like test them independently, put them in their own files, and import them wherever you wanna import them. We're gonna leave it in this file for now so we can see code side by side, but this is going to be a thing that you can use anywhere. So how do we get this use effect into this document title update? Well, for this use effect, it's pretty simple. Because they're hooks and hooks are composable, we can just drop our use effect inside of this use document title update. Now, we no longer have this chatting with variable, so we're gonna make this a little more generic so we can use it anywhere. Instead of having this, this document title that we're doing this like string interpolation, we're just gonna pass in a title because it's just a function and you can pass in variables. We're gonna set document title equal to title and we're gonna tell, to, tell it to synchronize the state change, or synchronize the side effect with changes in that title. So how do we use this in our function component? Well, it's just a function. So we can literally just do use document title update, pass it what we want to use for the timer, which is what we had before. Or not, I'm sorry, not for the timer, for the title which is what we had before. And then anytime that chatting with changes, our custom hook up here is going to know to relaunch that side effect because we're telling it to synchronize our side effect with that change in state. We're chatting with Kanye West and now we're chatting with Megacorp customer service. So you can imagine that as you, as you write more and more function components that use more and more hooks, you're gonna find more opportunities to abstract this code out and store it in files. Say you have places that need to make network calls and the network call is pretty consistent. You can abstract that. Anything you can put in a hook can eventually be, be, be basically composed into a custom hook to be used other places. The one thing you need to note about these though is you, if you use document title update in multiple places, so if you have it imported into multiple components, each one gets its own copy of it. So if you're using a document title update in multiple places, they're each going to fight over who gets to update the document title. But you need to know that these custom hooks when you, when you share them, they're not being actually shared, so you can't use it for like global state management, you can only use it for these side effects inside of these components that you're importing it into. So let's look at a couple more slides. How do I use React hooks? React hooks became available in React and React DOM 16.8, came out a little bit, little bit of time ago, so hopefully if you're on a more, more recent version of React, you already have access to these hooks. Hooks can be used alongside class components. So, that means classes are not going to be going away. You can continue to write classes forever if you want to. But I think that hooks are gonna make your life a little bit easier, especially with being able to share those custom hooks between, between your components. Now, I don't necessarily recommend going in and rewriting your entire production application using hooks. That would take a long time. It would introduce a bu bunch of new bugs. But as you add more components to your applications, think, is this simple enough that this would be a good launching off point for what I can do with, with React hooks? So if you're implementing for, say, a credit card component, like a credit card like input component, don't, that might not be a good first step. But if you're implementing something small, like something that needs to handle a title or something for the document, that would be a good first step. Also, as, you, as I recommend, as you go back and make changes to your old class components, if they're small and easy enough, go ahead and rewrite them in React hooks. It doesn't take too long. And I have a couple links, and I'll, I'll tweet out these slides after this talk. Um, I have a couple links. Uh, first thing you should probably do after doing this, if you wanna write hooks, is go read the docs. I know being told to read the docs is probably a little annoying, but the docs are really, really good. Um, especially the FAQ at the end of them, it gets updated pretty regularly. And if you have any questions about hooks, they're probably already in the FAQ and they're answered better than just about anybody, anybody else could answer them. There's also a post on um, Dan Abramov's blog that I really, really like and I really hope people go and read. After, you use, after you've used, use, effect, use effect a couple times, 
go out and read this very long, very in-depth article about use effect and what all can go wrong with use effect. I've shown a couple of examples of how things can break, but there's many, many more. And understanding why things break make it really easy to not break things. And there's also a related post about making set interval declarative. Set interval is kind of controversial with hooks. Some people think it like disproves hooks being good, but obviously we just wrote a way where it works. So as long as you know how to do how to do these things, do like a set interval in a declarative way, like this blog post is going to talk about in multiple different ways, it's very doable. Thank you all very much.